Well, welcome to a beautiful church podcast. I'm Adam White Scarver, and I'm here in our brand new video as well as audio studio. Um, this is a, a new season for us and a new experience for us. I've got Terry Davis here with us. Welcome, Terry. Yes, so good to be here. He is from On Point, which is a nonprofit here in town. Um, you're the vice president of Community Impact, right? That is yes, your that is official correct. title. Yes. Um, we'll get into more of what he does here in a second. Um, just explaining what this podcast is about and what we've uh, done before for those of you that are going to be joining us like on things like YouTube, which we have not really done too much of before. Um, this 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 podcast is about showing the beauty and diversity of God's church here in Chattanooga. And so previously, we've, we've always had Christian organizations on, or we have had um, churches, you know, something like that. This season, we're going through uh, a variety of nonprofits that are here in town. Uh, some of them are going to be Christian nonprofits. Some are do not have a religious affiliation like On Point, uh, but are well-established in town. You guys have been around for... 30... Yes, over 30 years now. Over 30 yeah. years, okay. Um, and what we want to do is show the the whole church in Chattanooga, look, here is a great, reputable nonprofit that you can partner with uh, to do within certain boundaries, right? Uh, good work in town. So there's, you know, lots of churches uh, work with nonprofits that are just, there's nothing necessarily Christian about giving food away to people. Um, although you could, your motivations might differ from the next person's, right? Um, and there are lots of churches and pastors that are looking for ways in which they can plug their people in to do good in the community. And so that's why we brought Terry here uh, from On Point. Um, we're going to get into all that, but uh, first I just want to let them get to know you a little bit, Terry, because I feel like uh, that's just always the best place to start. So, first of all, where are you from, Terry? Yes. So, I'm um, from right here in Chattanooga or in Hickson is where I was raised. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. And uh, how long have you been at On Point for? I've been at On Point for about 12 years now. Okay. So, and, you're... Well, I should say 12 years that I've worked there. I volunteered there for about three years. Oh, Yes. Okay. Yeah. So they they like the what they saw in the in the volunteer side of things. And by the way, just just curious, were you doing that uh, because of, you had Christian motivations to be there? Just yeah, uh, yes. I, the story of how I got involved was um, uh, being a, a full time youth pastor at the time. I was going into schools and hanging out with my students during lunch yep. and. Uh, one of uh, one of our, and she's actually still there, Dr. Mary Roush. Uh, she was do, leading a, a life group at one of our high schools that I was at, and uh, I was sitting at lunch, and she had came by, seen me several times, and introduced herself and said, uh, "Hey, talk to me. What what are you doing here?" And I told her, and I was like, "I'm a youth pastor in the area." And she said, would you love to come and just hear more about our program and come into the classroom and volunteer with us? And she showed me some of the topics that they were discussing at the time. And I was like, I would love to. That would be an, an amazing thing. You're inviting a youth pastor into a classroom. Yes, let me get on board with that. So I started volunteering with her, and it opened up to – about three other schools that I would go into and volunteer and connect and build relationships with students. Okay. All right. So let's get into um, just a little bit about On Point. What does On Point do? Yes. So we uh, we have several different programs, but uh, On Point started uh, years ago. Uh, it was birthed out of AAA Women's Services, which is now Choices Pregnancy Center. Okay. And uh, so we started there um, basically. Was this able... originally like an initiative of that and they spun it off into a separate yes. nonprofit? Okay. Yes. So it was basically preventative services is what it started out as. Is uh, um, We uh, came up with a curriculum uh, to reach students in high schools and middle schools of teaching them uh, about um, sex and sex education and uh, doing it in a way that was abstinence only 
And we're still, we only teach abstinence education even to this day um, in our schools, in our middle schools and high schools in Hamilton County and also in Bradley County. Um, mm-hmm. And it started from there and then On Point became its own nonprofit. Uh, and from there, we started several other programs uh, of where we kind of branched off because we would come in for one week and teach our uh, sex education, which meets the requirements for the state of Tennessee. Um, and uh, so we would come in and teach for a week. And then we noticed that so many students uh, still needed uh, a connection. They needed uh, to build relationships that they, they could not do just in that week's time. And uh, so um, our CEO now, Amy Pearson, uh, wrote a curriculum called Life on Point. And it is basically set up for a whole year. Uh, we go into middle schools and high schools, and uh, it may be during club time, before school, after school, uh, related arts time, uh, of where students volunteer to be a part of this. And it's basically open discussion. We talk about topics our students are dealing with today uh, from online activity uh, to oh, how gosh, to yeah. ba- you know how to balance uh, what's going on with social media today uh, to bullying uh, to um, you know talking about um, how to handle anxiety and stress uh, building healthy family relationships having healthy dating relationships all those things that uh, we get the opportunity to teach and work with our students for a year long like we'll meet with the same group of students for the whole year and those so those aren't done that the life on point isn't done during class time uh, or it sometimes is sometimes it is uh it just depends on what the times the schools give us okay uh, so we we're at the mercy of the schools um we come in to build uh these skills in students mercy or service of the schools the you work, you work around schools, what yes. works for them right sounds like right. okay and what about your abstinence education is that during school hours that is during school that's hours. what i thought yeah. okay most of the time it's taught during uh wellness or pe classes okay man i've got i've got some well now might be as good a time as any so once upon a time i um I was working in video production, and to make ends meet, I was substitute teaching. Because video production, this was back in the day when it was just kind of becoming, and YouTube was barely a, a thing. And so I, um, to make ends meet, I was doing substitute teaching. And when I did substitute teaching, I uh, every time that they called me in to do a health class, the health teacher wasn't there that day, right? But they had left me with the sex ed curriculum. They didn't want to teach oh, it. Yes, every yes. single time without <laughs> fail. But I'll say this, and I, I could go back into this. Actually, goes with some of the whole. St- um, you're bringing up a lot of memories for me because what I would do is I would, you know, I was, I, you know, I was a youth pat. I was in youth ministry too. I was volunteering youth ministry at that time. Um, but I, I would, you know, teach kind of the, the same values of abstinence. Um, and as I explained that, I mean, the kids just want, were hungry for life lessons. And I, when I substitute taught, I would, at the end of class, if we had time left over, I would give, you know, Mr. White Scarver's life lessons. And I would just teach them, uh, you know, usually it were, it would, you know, it's Judeo-Christian ethic, ethics, about how to live life. And I would talk about just about anything. Mm-hmm. Those kids, you know, started to get to know me and they'd say things like, um, you know, Mr. Whitescarver, can we finish up our work early today so that we can get some more life lessons? They were, they were hungry for the kind of stuff that sounds like you're, you're, you're coming in and teaching as a nonprofit. Yes. Um, and, and they would say, you know, sometimes, sometimes like sad lines, like I remember one, he was, I think he was in sixth grade, uh, he came up to me and he said, all we ever get told is don't do drugs. Mm. So thanks for teaching us something else. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I guess just for those people that are listening, I'm like, this is an opportunity um, to really help build lives on things that you might take for for granted because mm-hmm. you know it or your home environment or the culture that you live in, it feels stable and healthy kind of a thing. But just the sea of hurt that is in uh, in schools, or, and the abandonment of lessons that you know are picked up by 
used to be picked up by kids, but the more and more we've gotten into a breakdown of families and whatnot, this is this becomes super necessary. So I'm just trying to uh, put it out there. That th- this is this is tremendous to people. Anyways, yes. um, yeah. so that's that's what you guys have been doing. How long have you been doing the the Life on Point program? Yeah, Life on Point has been going on for. Uh, around 20 years. Okay. So that curriculum, and, and we keep updating the curriculum, and, right. you know, based upon, um, you know, what we're seeing, trends and things that are happening out there. Um, and and we're doing exactly what you were saying there. Uh, instead of the kids don't want, it, it was a program when I was growing up, you know, just say no, just say no right. to everything. And it was like, you're telling students or people to just just say no to this, and we're not giving them the truth. And so that's what Life on Point. That's what our other program. It's called Think on Point. They're, that we they're teach. hungry for the explanations that you're giving. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And and so giving them the truth and saying to them, um, you now like we don't get we don't control you. You make that decision. Yes. Uh, based upon the truth that you've heard. Yes. And so that that's that's our main goal is our focus is to equip them to thrive in life. So yeah, I mean, because if I'm out there and I haven't had the experiences that I'm, you've had a ton of, obviously, and I had a limited experience with, this is hard to get because you're thinking, oh, I'll go in and I'll teach kids. Are you are you crazy? Like this this would be the most boring thing ever. Kids would never listen to me. No, they actually are starving for somebody who's been there, done that, who's willing to speak into their lives, and they they pay attention with almost not always, right? Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of them that will pay attention with like. I needed somebody to explain this to me because I've been really searching and there's no no adult. I'm having to find it out from YouTube or something as opposed to somebody that I can interact with talking to me about this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and so part of that is building those relationships. And that's what, you know, life on point allows us to do is we're with these same students, you know, for a whole school year. Mm-hmm. And so um, they, they see how you keep coming back. There's stability there. There's someone that's there as a support for me, uh, and so uh-huh. you know. So that's that's a huge part of the whole uh, time that we're in there is building relationships with students. Wow. Yeah. So before I move on to any other things, um, what is your role in the whole organization of On Point? Uh, well, I started out as a uh, life coordinator. I was what I was drive to Cleveland and, and teach life groups okay. in, in schools up there, um, and then um, I, I would teach. I'd have a group of uh, schools here in Hamilton County that I would also uh, work with and and teach life groups. Um, like we had one group. Um, I remember at Hickson High School at seven fifteen in the morning. This is when we'd do this group. We had sixty kids showing up every morning. Uh, and, uh, I mean, we didn't have anything. We didn't offer breakfast or anything else like that. And they were, they were coming because they wanted to hear the truth. Yeah. Um, and so I started out in that position and then became a program director uh, over all of our programs at On Point. And uh, then uh, our CEO, um, Amy uh, Pearson, she seen the need uh, – for building more uh, community partners uh, that uh, we can't do this on a, a staff of 16 people. We need right. we need help. We need volunteers that will come into schools just like I did when I started out. Um, and uh, so that's kind of been my role now is switch to uh, helping the community see uh, what's going on, uh, what's happening in our schools, um, how they can be involved. Uh, and so that's kind of been my job over the last year now, is uh, building those community partners, uh, getting into the churches, helping the churches to see, hey, these are ways. If you're looking for ways to serve, you're looking for ways to connect, here it is, uh, an open door to come in and connect with us. Yeah, and I just – so I, I want to speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, I've been down uh, – in meetings with with the mayor, now he's not meeting with me. This is a lot of when he gathers faith leaders together, and I go to those things. And the mayor is up there, and he's talking. The, the whole mayor's office recognizes that the church in Chattanooga is a large group of people looking for ways to do good in their city. 
Uh, and, and so this is a, this is a thing that I think all nonprofits kind of need to sort of recognize. I mean, if you're, if you looked at the church all as at one, you know, there's no, there's no larger organization in town that is just trying to do good in town. I mean, we, there's the data on if there's a hurricane or something, the church is the one that's, you know, giving away the most. Usually there's, as far as social services, the church, as far as an organization, church as a whole, mind you, not an individual church is, is giving these things away to help people. So, um, that's, and that's why we wanted to have you here is because we want to help you connect with churches and help them connect back with you. So, um, Give me some, um, if somebody's trying to uh, get involved in the work that you're doing, let's just cover that and we'll, we'll tell some more stories in a second, but yeah. what, what, are the, like, what can they do if they want to yeah. get involved? What do they, how do they sign up, so to speak? They can, uh, <clears throat> they can be involved as, as much as they would like to. They can go on to um, our, our website, um, liveonpoint.org. And uh, they can go on and uh, fill out a volunteer application, uh, and they'll have a list of all kinds of things they can be involved in. They could, they can come into the schools with us. Um, we we do have to do background checks right. and things like that, but they can come into the schools. Uh, they can volunteer to. We have several groups that um, do uh, do life groups during lunch. And so we'll we pick up pizza and bring pizza in, so students don't have to stand in line. Um, and we we offer the students you know pizza during that time, so they could pick up pizzas for us, bring them bring them to the school. They could hand out pizzas, get to know each kid by name that comes through the line. Um, they can be a part of discussion groups. Uh, most of the time, uh, our facilitators they're up front. Uh, they'll they'll lead the lesson. And then we have some groups that are really large, like we have uh, 90 students at Tyner High School that we work with. And and so we may do a lesson up front and then break them in smaller groups. Mm -hmm. And we need we need people that would be willing to lead discussions uh, based upon what was just taught. Um, then, you know, just people that are willing to just build relationships there with students. Um, we work with... Um, an institute, uh, it's called the Search Institute. And they y years ago, they came up with uh, the 40 developmental assets. And these, mm -hmm. uh, these assets are what they feel like help determine success in a student. And so uh, one of the number one things you will see that kids mark on this list, we'll give them the 40 developmental assets. And that's kind of what we have built our curriculum on is those 40 developmental assets. And we'll give the list of those 40 to the student and say, mark which one you feel is most important for any student to have in their lives. The number one marked answer is always family support and uh, other adult role models in their lives. They, they may not act like it at times. Right. But they are, like you were saying, they are starving and hungry for the truth. They are starving to see that someone is in their corner. Yes. They, they are they are so searching for the person that they may act out at first. They may push you away, but they are looking to see, will you come back? Right. Will you be here? All their defense mechanisms. Yes. Yes. And, and the whole thing about, um, you know, youth not caring about adults or not wanting adults in their life kind of a thing, that... That's just I just don't find that to be true. They they actually want people that are older in their lives that they can talk to. Yes, most definitely. Yeah, I, I just if you hear anything, you know, definitely hear that. Of, yes. Yeah. yeah. No, that's so. Give an example or or two more about what those developmental uh, assets are. Yes, so uh, we they break them into two categories. One is uh, internal uh, assets. Uh, the, uh, the there's 20 of those, and there's 20 external assets. So the external assets would be like family support, um, other adult role models, um, uh, positive uh, friends in their lives, okay. um, uh, a religious community. Uh, you know, youth groups being involved in things like that. That is one of them as well. Um, 
So, you know, that's just an example of some of the external assets there. A caring school environment mm. uh, is another uh, asset. Um, the internal is things from integrity, honesty, uh, positive uh, vision of your future. Um, and that's a big one that we hope to always instill in our students right. uh, is to get them to see that. Um, we'll break it down even for them. We'll bring in a part of a, an activity we do is bringing in Jenga uh, and bringing in a Jenga tower. And so we'll set it up and the students automatically, they want to come in and just play, you know, right away. And we're, uh, we explain it like, hey, we're all like a Jenga tower. And, uh, you know, we're, we're all not born with the same amount of assets in our lives. And we have tons of assaults that are coming at you mm -hmm. every day. And so we'll get the students to start naming off. What are some of the assaults that are coming at students today, teenagers? And they'll start naming them off from drug and alcohol abuse to uh, family members being on drugs and, and mm -hmm. alcohol, family members being in prison, um, Mom and dad, divorce, they'll, they'll bring up all this, uh, you know, stress at home, uh, stress in school, uh, bullying, all these things. So we start pulling off all these blocks and we, we show them, hey, look, um, this, is you, this is you, this is this tower. Look at the holes that are in it, all the, the ones that are, that are weak right now. Uh, you know, you haven't fallen down yet, but your tower's weak. So what do you need? You need assets. So let's start plugging some of these assets back in. Maybe you got a coach that really cares about you and you're on this team. So we can plug that in. That's an asset mm. in your life. Maybe um, helping them to not take for granted some of the ways in which they can get some of those needs met that are already kind of in their life. Exactly. Like it, you know, being someone being but, in the but band. Any parent, if they had the time or the wherewithal or weren't out of the picture somehow, would. Tell a kid. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So that's that's how we use that lesson is helping them see, yep, yeah, we may not have all of our wounds filled, but uh, you've got some people in your life that you may not even be seeing. You've got some assets that are there. You may have that teacher that really cares. You may have that on-point person that just keeps showing up, and it's someone you can actually talk to. And so we plug those those blocks back in, and they see that. Um, we had one student one time that uh, she talked about how her mom and dad were always you know, arguing at home, and life was so stressful, and she would cry herself to sleep at night a lot of times. And she said there was this one asset she had in her life, and it was the piano. And she said the piano mm -hmm. restored hope and joy into my life. Hmm. And she would go to her room, shut the door, and she would play, put her on her headphones, and she would play her keyboard. And, and so some of those things we don't realize that are assets in our life that help restore hope, restore joy into our lives. So connecting it back to a largely church audience uh, and with pastors listening and some youth pastors listening, if, if a pastor or a youth pastor wanted to get involved, I guess— and I, I think they can probably put it together, but why why would you think that they should be involved? And then how could they get involved? Are there barriers to that or things like that that they need to be aware of or um, things that you just want them to know? Yeah. Um, if they want to be involved, they can they can reach out to to um, to us at on point at any time. They could they could send in an email. They could, like I said, you know, fill out the volunteer application. It's kind of a, a great way to start. Uh, but I would think it, it's the same way that um, enticed me to be a part of it. Is uh, I get the opportunity to be a part of students' lives. And if I'm a, if I'm a youth pastor, I mean, that, I'm a youth pastor for that reason. I'm a, Hopefully, I'm, yes. I'm you know I'm there to make the greatest impact on on students lives and um, what a better way than going uh into the the middle of the the battle which is right there at their school right. uh, meeting them on the battlefield and uh, helping them to navigate uh, life and you get to be a part of that with us and when we invite people to come and, and be a part of that and one of the reasons we reach out to youth pastors in the church is because um 
they genuinely care. Uh, and, um, you know, so you've got these students that are hurting. They may not be a part of their congregation or anything else like that, but they, they're, you know, they're, they're students that are looking. Uh, they're looking for a place to fit in. And, uh, you know, maybe that youth pastor can come and be a part of their lives and uh, then connect them somewhere along the line to maybe a youth event that they're having at their church. Uh, they can connect them to uh, a community of the church there uh, and help to build that asset in their life, that they belong somewhere. Right. Yeah. I, and I, I just want to be, if if you're a pastor or ministry leader of some kind or a youth pastor listening to this, I, I just want to encourage you there, whether you are aware of it or not, if you tell the story of On Point in your church or get someone to share a testimony about this, there's someone most likely in your church who's been looking for something like this where they can make an impact. You know, not every volunteer in in our churches is supposed to serve in the church. You know, they should be serving somewhere and it does not have to be something overtly religious. It can be a... a, a regular secular nonprofit like on point and people can come in and uh, find a way to make an impact that just lasts you know for as long as those people's lives go on I mean I was a youth pastor for years and you know I in fact actually at the end of today I have a scheduled phone call with one of the the my former youth that said hey I want to connect about some stuff and so that's what my commute home is going to be today right. they they come back to you years uh, later I didn't even think that that probably could apply it today so just just saying that um, you know this is it's not I, I don't want to you know uh, miscommunicate this is not just for like if you're a pastor or a youth pastor to get involved. There's people in your churches that would want to get involved. But a, a right. beauty of youth pastors, especially if they're full time, mm -hmm. can go to or even teach some of these programs and help have a bigger uh, impact with people that really need some help at this point, right? Right. And, and it is not very time time consuming. Uh, they, you know, they could, again, they don't have to they can go as far as they want to. And we've had youth pastors that have volunteered with us uh, that we train on our curriculum. Uh, and we, we do that free and people can come in and, and if they want to volunteer, we, we set up training sessions that work with their schedule and we give them the curriculum and, and they can follow along with it. Uh, they can even get up and lead groups if they would like. Uh, one day, it's not something that's required at all. Uh, or if they, like I said, they just want to come in one hour a week, pick a school that we're in, and say, "Hey, um, I think I'll be a part of that school with you guys." And what can I do to help? Um, and you know, it may be, "Hey, can you grab pizzas today? Can you meet us at this time?" And uh, we'll we'll start the lesson. And can you just be be there and be a part of students' lives? Did you play uh, sports or were you in the band or anything like that? In, in high school? I, I played uh, baseball and basketball. Were there like uh, booster parents or parents that came in and fed you guys pizza and stuff like that? Yes. And do yeah. you remember them with a smile on your face? Oh, kind yes. Of? Still yes. to this day. So yeah. don't think if you're just serving pizza that you're, you don't make an impact. Like I can I can recall those parents with, with gratitude of how they – I mean, and I was I was in the band, so I was like the biggest band nerd out there, and they, they would always slip me an extra piece of pizza because you know. Yes. Anyways. Yes. <laughs> um, so I mean, I'm I'm still grateful to them if they're out there uh, listening. Um, so give me like a can you give me like an an impact story or just like here's an exemplary story of something that happened in a kid's life. I mean, you kind of alluded to this of you know where they're where they're where they might have some. Uh, you know, they're always talking about it. They're, they want family help with their families. But is there like a story that would just be like, this is, this is the kind of thing that can happen, and this can happen at any given time when you're serving with On Point? Yes. Um, just so happens I was at uh, a middle school up in Bradley County, uh, and I was uh, we actually had one of our new hires that I was training. He was coming in to watch and be a part of the class, and I was eventually going to turn that school over to him and, and move on to a different school. And so we were there, and we had been teaching in this group. We had about 30 kids in the class, um, and we were coming in every week, uh, same group, uh, and it was a middle school. And we had this uh, one student who would keep showing up, keep showing up. 
And um, he would, a lot of times, he would just sit and would never say anything. But he was always there. And uh, so just so happened we had uh, a— Never a, said anything. Ne- Harley never said okay, anything. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, that's, uh, it's always this one, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, we happened to have a uh, intruder on campus. So we got in lockdown oh, that wow. day. And so we ended up being in the classroom for two hours with these students. Uh, wow. And so um, it turned out really well. We did a couple more activities with the students and just had some time to talk. And so we went around the room and uh, we had the kids, we had them sitting in a big circle and went around the room and um, said, hey, what what is the vision you have for your life? Like, can you tell us like one thing? What are you going to be doing in 10 years from now? And so um, a lot of the kids, you know, they took it serious. But again, middle school students, you know, who knows what kind of answer you may get yeah, sometimes. Yes. And uh, there was two boys uh, that were sitting ahead of this one young man who was still just sitting there really quiet. And um, and they said some things they were going to be doing as they got older that were just a lot of foolishness. And um, this young man just, and it had to do with some like drug issues and things like that. And this young man just almost exploded on them. And he stood up and he said, are you guys idiots? And... He said, you know, he said, it's about time I tell my story. And I, we were just in shock. And uh, like he's like, you could just see the fire in him. And he said, um, he said, as a matter of fact, he goes, I think everyone at this school needs to hear my story. And he goes, I come to school every day. I'm very tired. And uh, he said, there's teachers and administrators that think maybe I'm on drugs or what because I fall asleep in class. And they just don't know my story. And he said, um, he said, when I was very young, about four or five years old, um, my, uh, my mom and my dad, they divorced. My mom was having a very hard time. Uh, so she got hooked on painkillers. Mm. And it, then he said, you know, as I got a little bit older, um, you know, my mom started dating all these other men, bringing them into the home. Um, these men did not like me being around. And so they would treat me very harsh. He goes, there was times that they put my head through closet doors. And uh, he said, so, you know, he said, the state seen that I was not in a healthy place. I was coming to school dirty. Uh, and he said, this was like when I was in fourth and fifth grade. And so they took me away from my mom and they put me with my grandparents. And my grandparents are, are elderly. And uh, just so happened, I had younger siblings that also got taken away and put with my grandparents. And he said, so here I am now living as an eighth grader with my grandparents who are elderly and I've got younger siblings and no one understands that I'm the one that's up bathing them, helping them to get a bath at night, putting them to bed. Uh, I'm the one that's helping to cook and take care of them and make sure they're okay. And so I'm exhausted when I come to school. He goes, this is the one place that I feel safe that people have, actually welcomed me that they um wow yeah that they have not thought that i'm a loser not thought that you know i'm on drugs or anything else they've just taken me in as i am and uh you know and of course i'm sitting there like i am now in tears yeah. and uh, hearing this young man's story and it impacted him so much that just that time and him sharing his story just blew us away to the point that he continued being in our on point groups and became a leader in our on point groups in high school and uh, graduated with honors. Wow. And so it is just really cool to see the impact, even of that kid that you may think, hey, he's not listening, he's not paying attention. Never says a word. Never says it's a word. It's always the yes. Don't play poker versus the youth. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So, yeah. Wow. No, that's yeah. a great story. Yeah. Um, so then just uh, what are some, um, going kind of along these same things, 
right now at on point what are some of the big challenges facing the organization either i don't know maybe it's on an organizational level or just like this is where we're, what we're seeing in the community where we're just like oh my goodness yes yeah i i think one of our biggest challenges is uh, the fact that um you know we we are a, a small nonprofit. uh we we have you know, a staff of 15, 16 individuals, yeah. and some of those are part-time, uh, and um, and the need is growing. Just mushrooming with Chattanooga growing. Yes, yep. and more and more schools are wanting us uh, to be able to come in, uh, not just with our THINK program, which is our abstinence and risk avoidance education that we teach, but also with our LIFE program. And, yeah. and so, uh, and we don't have the staff to, to branch out as much. Uh, so, that I, you know, I think our greatest need is really, is, is, you know, our greatest resource, which is people. People that want to partner and be a part of this with us. Um, or just be a part of, like I said, students' lives. And so that, that's one of our greatest challenges I see right now is that there's a great need and uh, you know we're we're going to do the best we can to branch out and reach those needs, uh, and we just need people in place. Hmm. I also just want to say, you know, in an organization like yours, um, the best place to be involved, I feel, is usually being the volunteer, because you usually have enough going around you that it doesn't it keeps you from burning out. But let's say you're doing something that, you know, there, there's people that. Um, they struggle to find like a, a deeper meaning or a place where they're giving back. I, I just don't know people that volunteer for places like this and they come away just being like, well, gosh, I just wasted my time. Usually you get kind of addicted, Not might not be the right or appropriate word here, but like you see what an impact it's made on you that you're like, no, this is something that these kids need, but I need it as well because this this helps push me to be a better person in these other areas of my life in order to give back more to them. I mean, do you do you see that with, with people that are involved in your organization, your volunteers from time to time, et cetera? Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, there's so many uh, of our staff that still have stories, you yeah. know, uh, that of students coming back to them and and mm-hmm. we've actually we've got uh, a former student that uh, was just we just hired her almost two years ago, uh, and she graduated from college, and she wanted to be back oh, wow. and and do work in the schools, and we're the first place that she came back to and said, "Do you have an opening?" And uh, you know she she went through our program all the years of uh, being in high school. Uh, and she's seen the impact that it had on her life, and so she's come back to work for us now. So, uh, yeah, wonderful. I love. I yeah, that's the kind of thing that this is just such a. I mean, when I remember when you first told me about what you guys did, I was thinking, uh, oh my goodness, every, every every person that I know needs to hear about this ministry. Not ministry. Uh, every person I know needs to hear about this nonprofit and what they do, uh, because they could easily, you know, pull in people to get involved with it. So um, let's come back for a second to abstinence education, mm-hmm. which is not going to be controversial in the vast majority of the church, but is a a, a hugely controversial uh, topic mm-hmm. uh, to people. Like there could be people that are not from a Christian church listening to this, so. Um, I want to just clear up some of the, this is not browbeat and shame anyone who no. doesn't. Yeah. Yes. Just can you speak a little bit to abstinence education and maybe some of the approach? I mean, I will say this, there is no better foolproof method than abstinence, uh, even if people think it might be unrealistic. But I, I'll say from my from my standpoint, back in the, when I was always teaching those health classes, um, I I really, you know, that's where my conscience was when I was teaching this. And I just remember telling the kids, I, I, I mean, I will not forget their expression. I said, usually you're trying to get something answered that's not right here mm-hmm. from someone else. And I yes. said, if you don't have this worked out, I promise you that other person's not going to work that out for you. You're only right. going to make this more messed up. The number of like saucer wide eyeballs that just just from saying that that you know went across the whole room mm-hmm. uh was enough to say like okay yeah um yeah. we've been that that obviously hit home for them they've been trying to get an answer and i just you know this i'm not i'm not trying to i understand that there's a lot of people that 
you know, um, obviously we're agreeing to disagree at the end of the day, mm-hmm. and I, I don't have any power over them, but I feel that, you know, when it comes to abstinence uh, education, it's not it's not like a, well, I'm we're just trying to, you know, say no to people. This mm-hmm. is a, we're actually, there's stuff that you are not mature enough or in the right life situation for to do this, and it's it's going to cause you more problems than good. Yes. Uh, for, for, it might be a quick thrill, so to speak, but it's going to be long-term paying the price for it. And, right. and you know, those saucer-wide eyeballs, you know, all sort of told me that. So, sorry, I, I, yeah. I kept talking, but speak to this just a little bit, because I feel like, uh, this you should have a moment to say something. Here. Yes, yeah. So yeah, you, you're correct with that. Sometimes you do get uh, you know some negative pushback sometimes when it comes to uh, abstinence education. But how we teach it is a way um, of like sharing the absolute truth, you know, with our students of understanding that your heart and your mind are the greatest risk, um, yep. and uh, that uh, the impact that sex outside of marriage has on your heart and on your mind. And we do a a demonstration where we will take uh, two pieces of tape. And it's so simple, but we'll take two pieces of tape and and we'll put it together um, and like mask and tape or something. And and as we're, we put that tape together at the the very beginning, we're like, say you get into a relationship with someone and you're in this dating relationship and, um, let's say you've went to the movies several times, you went out bowling, you've held hands, uh, you've hugged, you've maybe even given each other a kiss goodnight, uh, you know, and then months later, that's about as far as it's went physically, um, you decide, ah, this is not working out. You know, you can still pull those two pieces of tape apart. Um, and then we will explain to them, uh, let's say that you're in a relationship that is very physical and you have uh, went all the way and you've had sex in that relationship. And we put the two pieces of tape all the way together. And then we'll hand the tape to the students and say, now try to pull that apart. Let's say you guys, you figure out this is not going to work out uh, and you, you decide to break up. Now pull the pieces of tape apart. And it's hard to pull the tape, tape apart. And one thing that we find is the tape starts ripping onto each yeah. other. And uh, then if you can clearly get the tape apart, the stickiness is not there for the next person that well, that's, comes along. That's and good. so explaining to them when a person does uh, have sex, the dopamine the serotonin and the oxytocin that is released yeah. in the brain yeah. and that it was designed to connect you like like putting concrete together with two individuals. Um, and so when when that happens outside of, of marriage uh, and maybe that's even multiple partners, then you're seeing that the dopamine release and the, the connection is not there like it was meant to be. Um, and so just to even explaining that to them, like it is one of those aha moments yep. of, wow, okay, I kind of get this. And then even explaining to them that you're made up of the mental side, the psychological side of you, the emotional side, the social, um, you know, the spiritual side of, I think you hit on it just a little bit there talking about when you were teaching that that spiritual side is becoming the right person instead of looking for the right person. Right. And so getting them to see that uh, and say, you know, all of these components is what makes you up. And when you're, you are out there uh, giving parts of yourself away, then these components are breaking down. Right. And so that's kind of how we explain that to them no, in, that's the, in the classroom. You, the, we're, we're psychosomatic beings. The body and the mind are deeply connected, and you cannot, you you can't just on a biological level, you cannot ignore what's happening. And you know, our, I don't know that our culture will say it, but I would I would say the amount of you know therapy that people go through and the counseling that people go through, breakups after um, you know sexual intimacy can really border or be traumatic experiences for a lot of people. Yes. Um, Or um, negatively addicting 
mm-hmm. uh, depending on the the you know the way that person's sort of mind goes and how they're functioning with people, and then you end up in a trap where you're not really you become less aware of how to fix what's going on here, and you become more about using other people and you know working yourself into becoming. Um, an, an unhealthy individual in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, yes, definitely. No, I, I so just, I, I really appreciate that you guys are taking that because I, you know, I don't think, you know, um, fairly or unfairly, you know, the church gets, um, you know, criticism about having the position that it has. But there, there are reasons where I don't even have to bring in religion or scripture to say this is not a good idea for your health and mm-hmm. well-being. Right. And there's so many people that um, are not religious who can also say the exact same thing. Right. So anyways, I just I just applaud that uh, for that stand that you're taking. Okay, so um, we've got just a, a few more minutes left. Um, if, you know, if people are we're asking people to we're, we're, at, we're at a ministry that's you know cares about praying for people how um how can people be praying for uh on point if you were to say this is my prayer request yes yeah uh keep our students in in mm-hmm. prayer at all times um uh, and just be praying that we can um show them a way that they can they can truly live life to the fullest mm. um and uh, you know, just be praying for their safety. Um, be praying for um, just a, a shield to kind of cover them each day. Uh, we're seeing so much violence and anger in our schools mm. uh, of where uh, students, students that yeah. are just they come into school angry. And so we, you know, we're we're praying that uh, you know, the life for you guys to pray that we see um, just a, a calmness in a lot of our students. And a focus that they would have a desire to learn and grow, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest things. And and that um, you can just pray that we would, uh, you know, we would lead in in a in a way that would uh, impact lives. Mm. No, thank you for that. Um, and then so let's let's answer this positively. You know, I've said you know what are some of the challenges or whatnot. If you guys were sort of casting vision, like if you, if there was one thing that you wanted people in Chattanooga to hear about what could be possible in this town, um, and then what what you what you envision even your work doing uh, in town, what would you sort of just give people the you know a, a mindset to think ideas to dream about? Mm. Ideas to dream about for on point uh, and in in this town in the community is. Um, I think one of our greatest visions is seeing all of our students thriving, mm. all of our students with a per- seeing their purpose and their vision for their life. Uh, and I think uh, that comes with us being able to get into uh, more and more schools. Um, I think it comes with us being able to financially spread out more uh, into more communities, more counties, Um being able to uh, get more of our updates to our curriculum out there, uh, so that uh, and it, you know, and all of that does cost money. Sure. Uh, so being uh, continue to be blessed financially with um, with what uh, we have and being good stewards of that uh, is one of the the visions that I could see for yeah. our community. No, it's a, it's an excellent vision, excellent plan, and I, but I mean, I think. Just on the, on the on the ground level, nothing's going to replace getting. I mean, those people that are in front of the kids know the kids and walk with the kids. If you mm-hmm. can, um, so again, just putting it out there. Uh, if you're listening, seriously consider. You know, either if you're in a place where you can send people their way, or maybe you're the person to do it. This could be a life changing thing, not only for a life that you're in, invested in, but also for yourself. Yes. Well, Terry, it's always a pleasure to see you. Yes. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, we're going to have uh, the appropriate websites on our uh, show notes so that you can track with On Point. You can get in touch with these people. They're, like I said, they're an established nonprofit in Chattanooga. They've been here. They're not going anywhere, and they're doing a great work here in town uh, to help make this a better place for everyone 
uh, in this community. So thank you again for your work yes. and for being here. Yes, thank you for having us. Thank <laughs> you.